recording. So, um, welcome everybody back here to the Martin E. Siegel Cathedral Center at the Graduate Center. Clearly, we had a one hour break since our workshop, and one hour in New York City is a very long time. This is enough time for people to check their mails, go on, do the other things, but um, um, also um, <coughs> we have felt it is most significant to have participants at the workshop. So we're going to have this uh, talk tonight here um, at the Siegel Center, which um, is being recorded and live streamed and will also serve as an archival um, an event. And it's our great honor to have Michael Kling here um, with us. And uh, as it reads in our uh, brochure, he's a choreographer and artist, and he's considered one of Europe's most notable thinkers in contemporary dance and choreography. He has been commissioned by leading institutions, including Ballet Frankfurt, Martha Graham Dance Company, the New Museum, Irish Museum of Modern Art, the Hallwarts Gallery, and other places. As the artistic director and CEO of Dagda, he developed an extended socio-political engaged choreography referred to as a social choreography. And it's a very significant, we think, also groundbreaking concept, and we are thrilled um, to have you here uh, with us. It encompasses interdisciplinary thinking, writing, curation, and centrally choreography that works equally at, ho is equally at home in performing and fine arts. He was awarded a PhD from Edinburgh College in Arts in 2009, and in 2017, uh, Michael took up a position of Associate Professor of Practice uh, in Dance at Duke University, and uh, so it's a, a great honor to have you here. I also participated in the Blackboard uh, choreography piece, which you once uh, also did here in, in New York. And with us here is Corey, um, who is a PhD student um, um, at the uh, program. And it was actually Corey who came to me and said, this work is so significant. We should do everything possible to get uh, Michael uh, here. And um, uh, we might have done it anyway to others, but still, it happened also because of you. And this is also significant for us. The Siegel Center bridges academia and professional theater, international and American theater, and the, the idea of uh, dramaturgy, dance, it becomes more and more central. The dance dramaturgy or the dramaturgical ideas for contemporary choreography are central, we think, to uh, what is really uh, groundbreaking avant-garde theater, ensemble work uh, done by companies like Castellucci or Fabre or, um, or many, many others. And um, so it is a real uh, significant um, event to have uh, Michael um, here um, with us. So this will be a conversation mostly between Corey and Michael. Michael will also give a bit of a talk. He prepared some thoughts on it. We have a microphone on because it is also live streamed and we welcome um, our viewers from how around a great partner um, to do that. It will also be later on in our archive. So thank you all also who were here for participating. And um, <clears throat> maybe we'll start right away. So Michael, um, we said it's the first New York uh, uh, iteration, but you said uh, something, a workshop happened before, and I'm gonna give you my mic. No, no, it's good. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. oh, very good. So um, tell us, how, how was it today? What did you not see? Uh, it was really amazing. <laughs> not <laughs> like, I, did, I didn't see it, so like I might. Why don't how many people of you were actually part of this now? Was it, only three people were. Not. A bit closer than mine. So, 70% or something. <laughs> uh, so sorry for speaking to you through a microphone, but uh, as Frank said, it's for the recording purposes, and otherwise we would just sit around in a circle and chat. Uh, <coughs> I didn't see it. Why, do you, why, don't uh, you, why don't you want to be in the room? And tell us a bit about the work. Okay, well, Parliament started uh, probably around 2000, and 12 or 11, my first thoughts around creating this work. And I moved to Greece at that time during the really height of the crisis, of the economic crisis. And when you really felt like that the society was, a wound was breaking open and it became very fragile, the social fabric, uh, as it still is. But at that point, it was like this, this breaking open of the wound, which was very strange to witness and be part of it as well in some way and I was kind of trying to think how to respond to that I, I embedded myself in, in a lot of protests that you saw on television with it being tear gassed and without really knowing because I don't speak Greek what's going on I just do kind of 
get a sense of the situation. And, and I thought, what can be done? And I, I felt like there was so much finger pointing. Like everybody in, in Greece knew who to blame. Like the lawyers blamed the judges, the judges blamed <laughs> the politicians, the politicians blamed uh, Europe. And if you would make a diagram, it was just one big blame game. Uh, and what I thought is the whole perception of our own self being in the world is so wrong and it's so problematic and we just ignore that we have no way or no understanding of being sustainably in the world as a, or as, as Zizek says, you know, we have no way of imagining the end of capitalism, like what comes after. There's no way of imagining these things because we, we don't experience other forms of, and we're so baked out of this system. We've been so growing, you know, it's our system. It's what we are, have collectively created and now individually we hate it. Uh, but, <laughs> but we have no idea and, and no vision of how to get out of it because the thinking that is available to us is from this certain, th goes through that modality uh, that created the system. So, and I've always been interested in systems. I mean, my PhD is this kind of cybernetic systems theory, the philosophy of systems, system theory, the systems theory, meeting choreography. Um, and, and then I started just by, tea. I taught a lot around that time, guest professor at various different universities. And I just tried out different scores and over about three years, I honed them <coughs> in and got them more and more precise. And then did one work, not this work, on, on, a, on a rooftop on a Greek island, which was parliament. The first time there was really parliament on a Greek, on a rooftop. And there's a video, there's a really beautiful video documentation of this as well. Uh, and after that, I put it in the Binaki Museum, which is a big, one of the major museums in Athens for two weeks. And then it started to kind of have a life uh, until the first time. And then here in, in, in New York, I did it as a private thing for the Martha Graham Company. Uh, and it was videoed off by uh, Gideon Koppel, who's, who's like a fantastic documentary filmmaker, British make a very highly esteemed but we never had the, the money to actually edit it so it just lies in a hard disk in my drawer uh, and and then it, it went to the National Museum when I went to Duke I brought it kind of as my introduction to Duke to bring as many different professors and and uh, students to the table to experience that and so it ran for a week at the National Museum which was very satisfactory, I think, like in the sense of arriving and, and getting into serious discussions with a lot of different faculty from a different fields of knowledge uh, and introducing this kind of thinking in a different way. What's the, it's, what's the video that's playing behind us now? This is not Parliament, This is right? not this Parliament, is no, I, but I really like it and I don't show it very often <laughs> <laughs> because it's not a, you, you can't access it usually, and I, I just, I actually thought, what should I show? And this is a good work to show. It's called Jerusalem, and it's, it's again a choreography for Greece. It's called Choreography for Greece as well, the subtitle. Uh, and it's really made for the Athens Festival. It was a commission by the Athens Festival <coughs> uh, where I worked with 18, I think, predominantly non-dancers that were curated from all over. They were really carefully curated in terms of we wanted a, a very diverse population in terms of socioeconomic background that reflected Greece in some way and then put them towards an ec ecstatic kind of situation and, and design or choreograph or provide a ritual to really flatten social structure. And it was surprisingly successful in the sense that it, it turned into this kind of strange love fest. Like everybody who, who took part kind of fell in love with each other. And it was this complete diverse body of people and could 
observe them as an audience member falling in love and and and, and it just didn't matter who's who and what. you know the identities just were very raised in front of you and it was very powerful to watch so a lot of the audience was really in tears and it was just an emotional strange thing and also it was totally porous so audience members could join the situation there was no defined clear cut instructions and kids would join uh, people with special needs would join uh, some people with special needs were also officially in the cast uh, and it was similar to parliament the whole thing was three days of rehearsals and then three days of performances so a very very fast process and it wouldn't work if it's a slow process yeah. like this particular work needs this unfamiliarity with each other it needs this awkwardness it needs the strangeness still uh, and this freshness it, it does something so it, it can't be faster it can't be slower other work I worked very long periods of time and so, so and it was produced right after Parliament. So it, uh, it, there's a strange, invisible link between these two works. Uh, and I always think maybe that because they're both done in Greece at a certain particular time. So they have, they have something in common. <laughs> I wonder, could you talk about um, social choreography sort of more broadly? I don't know if that is something that, I mean, when I first met you that was the first time and, yeah. and first got to know your work that was the first time that I encountered social choreography as an idea and I remember the conversations we had then mm -hmm. it was a couple of years ago three three years ago or so you were struggling still with what social choreography is or could be oh, I'm, I'm still that may struggling. be a direct quote <laughs> uh, I'm still struggling I mean if I if I get uh if I get like two hours to talk about social choreography it's a lot easier than if I get like two minutes to figure out what it is. So, it, but as, I, I equally think that speaks to the beauty that it's still an em emerging field, that we haven't found the language fully for it, that we are still grappling, that we have a lot of prototypes and actually a lot of uh, work that we have already realized, not just, from, uh, not just from pieces in terms of artwork, but actually in institutional interventions and institutional work in building up kind of semi-utopian institutions and, and running them over years. Uh, but what it, how do I even start? <laughs> uh, what, what I think social choreography is, it recognizes the fact that A, we are deeply embodied and most of our life is happening on an unconscious level and that our way we understand our embodiment, like how we make conscious our embodiment and the maps we draw out of that, of our environment, directly determines the institutions and the nations and the interactions we build. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, and this is recursively informing itself. So the institutions then inform our understanding of embodiment and how we think ourselves into the world. And, and as part of this kind of social choreographic drive, we feel like that we are just absolutely skewed in our understanding of us living and the context of our, you know, end of our context, of how we live in our context and the maps we draw out of it. Uh, so, what we're trying to, what, what I'm trying to do is this intervention and different people who, it's not just me who works in social choreography. So I mentioned Steve Falk, who's very, a, a, you know, big figure in social choreography in that sense. Uh, but I work very much on the level of embodiment. Like I'm interested in get, going to this darkness where it, which, which probably is like a, a kind of psychedelic embodiment where, where you, and psychedelic in the sense of the word means revealing the mind. Mm -hmm. uh, so where you almost thunderstruck of, of you taking out of your normal social understanding of the situation. And you, you're dipped into a psychedelic situation 
where you're not where it's dark, but it's also pretty sane. Uh, and I've heard that a lot in, in Parliament. Like, I was just sitting there for, for two hours rocking. And I said, oh, I'm sorry. And they were like, no, no, this is, I've never felt sane in my whole life. <laughs> yeah, so you have this strange thing that actually what we think of mental illness, everything is becoming kind of questioned again and, and breaks open that way. And there is a, uh, yeah, a darkness at the end, edge of consciousness that needs to be interrogated. And, and I think it brings out a different way of relating a different way of listening again, and a different way of, of thinking of ourselves within ecological structures, but like within an ecology, to understand our own belonging within it, rather than thinking ourselves out of it, uh, and, and behave as if we are not part of this. Uh, so that's my, I find that's my role. Like I, I create this kind of very strange uh, methodologies, like technologies, and I see them as technologies. Like I don't see them this work as artwork. I, of course, do because I, you know, I have a, a career as an artist. But in a way, I also don't. Like, I, I'm super happy if communities take it up, this work, to do their work. Uh, and, and to really, like in ancient Greek, in, in ancient Greece, you had, to, you had to go to the theater as a good citizen. This was part of citizen education. There wasn't an op it wasn't optional. Uh, it, it, you had to go weekly to the theater. And I, I like this notion of thinking this is a, this a, it's an act of citizenship to do parliaments, mm -hmm. to engage yourself in these kind of situations. It should be an active part of citizenship. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's mine. And then, uh, and Steve would, would work very much on an institutional level. I just want to add that. Like he, he just goes and gets institutions to dance and gets them into a psychedelic state of panic. Uh, and, and, and that's his role and it's... it's the Baker's a, Union in Frankfurt, right? Yeah, well, it's an un, ungrateful role, uh, <laughs> but he really goes into institutions and it's not institutional critique at all. Like, it's not institutional critique in the terms of he doesn't make art at all. He works in the social services, but he goes there and connects you know, almost where, where people create blind spots and he erases blind spots and he connects every institution with everything else uh, like a child would uh, in a childlike manner and, he, and it creates amazing synergies but also the institutions can't carry it, like they're overwhelmed, they're like panicking, they're, they're losing their identity uh, and, and it's always a, a struggle but it's, it's a life-giving struggle because it bursts something and, and the institution doesn't even know they do social choreography at the end, but they're proud of the, that baby that they burst. So. Have, you, have you read Emergent Strategy? Or do you know Emergent no, Strategy? No, but... The, the book. I've just been, um, because I, I, I read it for the first time pretty recently um, and have been thinking about it a lot in the, the context of social choreography and both of, the, both of these sort of levels, the level that you're talking about the level of embodiment that you work on, and the, and the institutional level that that Steve works on, um, because it's a it's actually a book that's really big in activist circles right now. Um, yeah. The author's name is Adrian Marie Brown, but the the argument is that um, that we need to, in order to really create large level change, um, we need to uh, we need to embody embody that change and enact that. That change or enact the the vision we want to see at, at even the smallest micro level. So in one to one relationships, yeah. and then within smaller within like activist organizations, and get it, and then sort of scaling up from there. But it's also very explicitly taking a, um, a an ecological and sort of systems based like. Yeah. metaphor as the as the impetus for doing it um yeah, yeah it makes complete sense i mean my early work even before when i go right back when i was still working in contemporary ballet i was really concerned with modeling emergence mm -hmm. like modeling using mathematical models of how to model emergence behavior amongst different agents which is a dancer uh i just gone away from a more kind of Western view, in a, in a way, traditional scientific view, maybe, of modeling. 
things and go more into an experiential uh, lived embodied view uh, and approach which suits me a lot better and I feel more comfortable in that. Something you were saying before um, was uh, uh, brought up a question for me that I always have about this kind of work which is how should it be critiqued or how should it be written about or how would you like to see it written about or evaluated is a is a bad term but that is yeah, how we, we, we just talked view. about this that right. that actually parliament has never been written about even though it's been two exhibitions uh, in, in prominent museums um, it's been around uh, it's been video installations in museums it, you know the video played in, in, uh, in different museums and yet nobody writ and there are thousand people who did it, roughly. <laughs> so, but the writing it seems difficult. It seems like where do you even start? And and it, it cannot be critiqued in a, or I, I wouldn't care for a traditional critique. Uh, so it, it's something that that writes out of itself, I guess. And you have to put it within the framework of ideas, I think. You know, if it sits, as you say, with these emergent strategies, you know. Uh, if it sits within the framework of ideas to, to kind of illustrate, then, then I think that would make sense. Yeah, and I, um, I just want to point out, um, most of you, of course, were here, but how truly radical um, this idea of a social choreography is. Um, like Brecht in his Der Stücke, who was the first to say, we can do theater without audience. He said, um, workers should play with the factory owners and switch roles, and you don't need anybody watching it. It's an experience. It should, as Michael said, should change your life. It should change your view. So what uh, he did today is kind of, a, of course, is an instruction-based art. He had, you know, instructions. We could type them up, I think, or give out people. Could happen anywhere, even without you, anywhere in the world, in a safe space, if someone passes. So it's um, an art form that doesn't have the central godlike figure anymore. There's not a writer, there's not the choreographer, there's no director. Um, this kind of decentralization of the authoritative voice, which is a radical thing. And we have seen it, of course, in contemporary theater, where you see, work, look at the work of a Robert Wilson, you know, where light and sound and movement and text and costumes and uh, all the sculptures are equally distributed. They're not, nothing is worth more or less, but already their text is no longer in the center of it. Ballet and movement, of course, it never really was. but there was always the vision of the genius artist, of a Balanchine, of Joan Robbins, of a Mark Morris. Michael says, no, I don't even have to be in the room. I can go out. So he says, it's more important for me that there's this interaction, a social choreography between people that's more significant than my realization as a great choreographer, which you, um, of course, are or could do. So it's a radical, radical, reinterpretation of what dance is about, choreography is about. It's a democratization. Every, there could be professional great dancers from the company, the Graham company, but also someone who walks in from the street and they have something to say to each other. They experience an atmosphere, what you talk about. So there's something which is very hard to communicate or write about or to do because normally as a spectator, you're supposed to be in the seat and applaud brilliant people who are experts in what they're doing. Here you are asked to be in the room and participate however you want. You do something or nothing, you can touch someone or not. You, it, it's up to you. It is a, a model. Why theater or dance is interesting because it's a model for something. It stands for something symbolically, but also for real. It happens on a stage, it happens in a room, it can happen in the real world. And that kind of symbolic representation of a vision for a 21st century you know, work of art is, I think, is very, very strong. And of course, it's easy. You look at it; you don't really see it if you look at the surface. But I just want to reinforce: it is a, a truly a, a, a radical rethinking and asking, you know, in the name of a Joseph Boyce and others, or or a minimalist who said, "Who cares? I don't want to be a Michelangelo manipulating bronze. I would like to see the surface of the metal. I would just see what's there. What a, that's more significant than me as a master artist manipulating material." And so I think it's an attempt to, you know, grapple with, and as you say, we are still in the dark a little bit trying to, to find out what it is, but Brecht said new theater needs to be done when we have new times. New times need new forms of theater. This is a very serious 
I mean, there's, there's, there is also a social choreography uh, book called, you know, the book called Social Choreography from 2005 by Andrew Hewitt, which came out, he's a comparative literature uh, professor, and it came out completely parallel to us. Like, we never heard of Andrew Hewitt before. Uh, and I even when I saw it, I was like trying to read through it. It was far too tense, like gave up on it, left it in the corner for a couple of years. And then when I picked it up, it's actually dealing with this, what we're talking about, and dealing with that very thoroughly, but discussed it in a complete different way and very theoretical. And uh, But he has this great definition of it, that choreography is always the rehearsal of utopian, nevertheless real social situations. Because you're embodied in that situation, you're actually rehearsing it. Whatever you rehearse, whether to march like a yeah. like an army, uh, whether you find new ways of, you know, you're never that close to people. You're never all over people. <laughs> so you're rehearsing a kind of new way of being in the world with other people that you just otherwise wouldn't do. Uh, so yes, it's sort of utopian, but it's also real. Uh, and so, and I feel that rather than just having that as a side note on choreography, I feel like this is a pretty important realization. Uh, and it should become much more the center of choreography, in my view, especially in my practice. Like this notion of how do we bring that because that is, can really go to work in the world, these, these strategies, these, these new rehearsals of utopian uh, social structures, where we can actually plan for uh, a new kind of imagination, where we can cultivate a new kind of imagination. As you said, we can't imagine this, what comes next, so we have to find ways to, to get our awareness to expand upon the imagination. Yeah, there's something really, really deeply different to me about this work than oh, yeah. um, then a lot of the participatory, quote unquote, participatory artwork that I see or th and theater work that I see. Um, uh, yeah, and I'm, I, I don't know. I'm yeah. curious what you think about about participatory work in oh, general I, because I, there's something being being inside of this feels. I go to see a lot of participatory. Uh, I, I'm, I'm personally deeply, you know, I'm, I'm very awkward in participatory thing. I, I hate it. Like I can't do it. I can't deal with it. Like it, it, it freaks me out. And I'm probably shy or introvert about this kind of thing. And and whenever somebody wants to come and touch me, it's like, <laughs> really, or, or wants to drag me on stage, it's just nothing like that I like. And maybe that's also why I created this, <laughs> this structure in a way to facilitate for my own. That doesn't mean that you don't want to be part, you know, that you don't want to partake. It just means that, that the, part, the, the methodologies of partaking are not refined enough to cater for your need uh, or to your need. And so, in a way, I love doing parliament. Like, I absolutely love it because you're just doing it in your own time. You're, you're not forced to, you don't even feel like it's participatory. It's like it's a wrong term for it because you're in it. You're not participating, you're, you're it. It's a kind of, yeah, it just feels different than, than traditional participatory work. And I don't, I, I think there's brilliant participatory work out there. Absolutely, I don't ditch that, but I, it's just not for me. Like I'm, I'm kind of freezing up and going like, oh, please not me. Don't pick me. <laughs> <laughs> we have some audience questions, maybe? Maybe, or do you have something you want to share still from well, this the is, talk? I'm just saying that this or? is the very first oh, your video, right. uh, parliament that happened on Idra, on the island of Idra, uh, without cars. <laughs> it's an island where you can only walk, and there are donkeys and, and your legs. And this is on a rooftop in the harbor. And this is actually Steve Falk we were talking about. So he, he really walks the walk. <laughs> uh, the blue t-shirt. Yeah. But the other participants are mostly gathered, not all, but uh, you know, mostly gathered from, from the local cafe just beforehand. And we said, do you want to go into parliament? Uh, and I had a brilliant filmmaker with me who, who is my wife, luckily. Uh, and... <laughs> 
And so we, we just set it up within the whole thing within 30 minutes. And we ask somebody if we can use their rooftop and just, just ran it. And it, it, it worked pretty well. I don't know, does it not play? This one was like a whole sunset, probably two and a half hours or so the first time. But it is wor worth noting that now parliaments are usually six to f 10 hours. And, and that's how you should think about it. They are long, long. How many people participate? When? Where? Parliament sessions uh, of what Between, is the I think this was very small. This was only eight, nine, 10 people. And then you have usually 20, 30, 40. That's, that's usually it. No. I have done it with more than 40 at one session, I think. Or mm -hmm. 45 is probably the biggest, I don't know. Do you participate? Or yeah, yeah, a lot. I love it. <laughs> it's like a drug. It's like a, I mean, it's, it's sort of like Alice. It feels like, not that I, no, I, don't, <laughs> I don't advocate anything, but uh, it, it does feel like, like an induced experience yeah. of some sort. And, that's very mysterious. I mean, that should alone be a discovery. <laughs> like, I feel like this wasn't even the planned discovery, but it's sort of a discovery that something is shutting off mm -hmm. and something else is becoming more to the fore that we are constantly actually operating in. Mm -hmm. So what we termed mammalian wisdom, Steve actually, who's done the dramaturgy for, for Parliament, uh, you know, he teams it as, as kind of a mammalian wisdom. And I think it's a quite interesting term for this. There's something else coming Mammalian through. in a sense of... Uh, Mammalian, like mammals. Like, a, we're, 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 like it makes you feel like a mammal. Uh, and also, if you look at it from the outside in Parliament, very often we end up grooming, wooing, playing, uh, sleeping. And it's sort of very basic. It's not, it doesn't, you know, it's not getting very complicated. Like, Nobody's reflecting on Max. <laughs> like that's what I feel like. In Parliament, you just don't care about stuff. It's, it becomes just different. You have a different kind of, and as, as if your consciousness is zooming in and expanding into other areas that are very, I don't know, just, just mammalian, mm -hmm. without saying going backwards. You know, like I think that's the wrong way to describe it because that's what we are. Mm -hmm. And if you, People, some people love dogs, like, like I do. And if you really go into kind of dog behavior, and, and uh, you will see that in, in, in the way you relate to the dogs, and even in dog packs, how they organize themselves, and who's leading, who's not leading, who's smelling whom, and, and uh, from what side they approach each other, and what a bite means, and what different levels of biting, like in, embodied kind of reactions. It totally organizes the whole pack. And I think we are very similar without noticing it, yeah. without recognizing that, uh, that our organization is, is so, so choreographed, but on an evolutionary uh, level. Well, you made me think because I Okay, let's give you a microphone so we uh, can oh, hear. Yes, record, yes, yes. <coughs> Um, you made me think, oh wow, this is, okay. It does, huh? Um, so I, I was doing it, and, and now that you're talking about it, I guess I, I take a chance and voice out a little bit of my experience of it. Uh, at some point I was thinking a lot about um, a text that Donna Haraway wrote, and she's writing uh, the text, the name of the text is Orientation Matters. And at some point, she's talking about how she really enjoys going to the zoo to see how humans talk about the animals. Because she feels that when humans are talking about the animals, she's actually getting to know those humans better. Yeah. And so I was thinking on this text, and, and when as, I, as I was inside, I was like, oh, but wait. Because at some point, I, I started looking, right? As animals kind of thing. But then I was like, oh, wait, I am an animal too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I came like, yeah. yeah. Anyways, I just wanted to share the realization I had. My psychological It, it, it has experience. something of like a zoo thing, Parliament. has something of a zoo. It reminds you of a, a zoo. 
I feel always like, if I'm in it, I, I look like I'm in a zoo. Of, it's all so strange and, and yet so fascinating. Mm. <laughs> and, Um, let's have a microphone. Um, one is, do you always tell that story about J Henry James? And yes. That's exactly, always there? Exactly the same way. Okay. And the second one is a different question, but I, I'm, a, I'm a theater director, so I, I always think about like watchability, like watching um, other people and how strange that is like like just how and in the theater you have people over here looking at people over there who often are in the dark and it's just like what I found really interesting or what felt like what allowed for people to do things they may not have done was that we spent a lot of time first trying to just watch each other and observe each other and you frame it so well that that's part of what's happening is that I felt like when people like got close to people, it was earned in some way because we were training ourselves or undoing a lot of things about it's okay to see other people and to be seen. And I think that articulation of observing yourself, observe other people. And and I'm, it just made me think about like, and then it becomes really great to be able to watch everybody in this free way. And then you're like, oh, just the sort of, the way people carry themselves, they suddenly felt comfortable just kind of like being seen. And I'm just curious, did any of this come out of you as a choreographer, like wanting to feel like there was a performance quality that you couldn't accomplish? That's an interesting question. Uh because, it, because I just felt like everybody was like ultimately really watchable and everything they did was... Yeah, yeah. I mean, my, my, I think my work, also if it's not, par, uh, not, if it's not parliament, I'm working with uh, a mixture between very professional dancers and non-dancers and, and I always try to get them to that state where it becomes endlessly watchable. Like I could just watch them for hours and end just moving because they're so in thought and so in. And I think with Parliament, I kind of aimed initially, I remember now when, when you asked that question, that I, I realized when I, when I analyzed photographs of performance uh, or even public spaces, it's very hard to get a space, a photograph, where people don't face in one direction or in a purposeful direction or don't. Uh, surround themselves by one organizing principle, like somebody pointing or somebody looks. Um, and I wanted this, I thought, you know, but when, when they talk, when Michael Hart talks about the multitude or the, this kind of, we need to find a more complex way of organizing ourselves, you know, with more uh, interesting kind of narratives going on, rather than this always central, uh, still proscenium arc kind of thinking. Even if we go out, it seems to be so prevalent in our being that I literally couldn't find a photograph that represented Parliament before I did Parliament uh, at all. Like where, where I just saw different people facing different directions, doing different things, uh, and I found that bizarre that I couldn't find that at all. That that was a strange thing. And and after I did Parliament, after I did this one, my wife sent me a, a clip which is also very fascinating, a Super 8 clip on YouTube, which hadn't, didn't have any description of it. And it, it was like a parliament. It, it was amazing. But it was obviously from the 60s, and I was like, oh, damn, you know, these performance artists in the <laughs> 60s, they did it all, you know? And then, basically, it was in Greek, all the description. So I said, what is that? And it turns out that this was a, a footage that was a big scandal in Greece from the 80s when they discovered that a mental asylum was just left on its own devices and that on an island there was a mental asylum but they put all the mentally ill people and left them to rot. And this was the courtyard filmed off secretly. And I didn't know that. I just saw that some performance artist <laughs> discovered parliament. Uh, and 
And that's also super, super interesting. Like I couldn't believe that the way people behave, this, this being, this shaking, this sitting next to each other, this walking aimlessly, this organization where it's not connected, it's actually what we regard as mental illness or, or, or what if that's permanent, if you cannot negotiate your social coding, that's when it stops being sane. I thought what you were saying uh, just before we came in here about um, about uh, par using parliament as like embossing parliament on dancers and then putting another score on top of that is is um, was a really interesting. It, a different, it's a different way of looking at the kind of training that you would have to have in order to have a particular performance style, sort of what you're talking about. Um, the, it, and, and I also hadn't realized that that was um, because I didn't really know Parliament and I was, but the piece that we were talking about, I didn't, I didn't know until today that there was this layering of, of scores. Of experiences. Like uh, it, it was using Parliament almost as an experiential dream. And then on top of it, I built another structure that we could refer to. And that was more directional and maybe purpose driven in a strange way. That was for the Martha Graham company. Uh, and it was a work that I retitled into State of the Union. <laughs> so it's actually, it's, uh, and again, the, it, it lies unedited in some draw. But it was, it was great. <laughs> it was great. And there's no proof. <laughs> so what are your influences? What do you, um, what do you feel uh, influenced your work, your thinking? Um, I think my biggest influence in thinking is Gregory Bateson, who's an anthropologist and sort of the founder of system theory, one of the kind of intellectual godfathers of the counter culture in, in the 60s. Uh, also, like he had a very wide research into ecology uh, that, that encompassed alcoholism, that encompassed uh, dolphins, uh, like amazing breadth of research and important research. He was one of the founding or godfathers of family system therapy, for example. Uh, and because he understood systems and he thought about systems very deeply and he didn't uh, think that it was limited to any one organism or any one but it, it, you know, species, but he thought it was the way the living interacts with the non-living or whatever the non-living is, that there is actually processes at play and inter place, so this notion, the pattern that connects and relations, uh, much before relational art was a thing. Uh, and he wrote three books, or four books, but three on, on, on the theme, and they are just super influential. So it's, he's the most important thinker you've never heard of, that's his catchphrase. Like I'm, I'm, and I'm a fan, like I'm a deep fan. Of, and, and for example, 10,000 Plateaus, took the, the, the notion of Plato's from Gregory Bateson. So he's very influential amongst uh, a, a kind of intellectual writers, but he's not known. Uh, so that would be my major influence. Otherwise, I would, from within the arts, I would say Boyce is probably an influence, a strong influence. Foresight was my mentor, and I sort of acknowledge that, uh, that I was, at times, I wasn't, I, he was a super interesting time because he, he employed me as a choreographer when in I was- In Frankfurt? Or yeah, yeah. As a guest choreographer for Bali Frankfurt when I was 26. Uh, but I was employed as a guest choreographer. So it was very strange. I worked as a, as a full choreographer. I couldn't fathom it even. But I was also allowed to actually observe the whole process and be part of that family and understand what thoroughness means, I think. Like this absolutely obsession on with your art form. Uh, and that's what I learned there. I think those, yeah, I would say these, these are my influences. I don't know, there are probably a lot more. Any other thoughts or comments or? statements. Maybe, Actually, yeah. I, I, because I thought in my preparation I had this great quote.
vote, and I just thought I should leave it out because if I can <laughs> access this because the thumb never works. It just doesn't work. My thumb scanner does not want to work. Just stick with me. No, okay, maybe I'll do it. Oh, there it is. And this one is, a, I like that because it sort of refers to Parliament. It's a bit different, but it's written by a student of mine that I've just been teaching at Duke. Uh, she's an anthropology major, so never really danced before. And there's this, in, in the beginning, I always say, in the very beginning, first classes, I say, uh, dance. You know, the theme is, the, your, your task is to dance. So afterwards, you can say, I have danced. And then I leave the room. Uh, and that's the first introduction. It's always the first introduction. Uh, and so they are freaking out what that could possibly mean and how do I possibly do that and what am I doing here. And so she writes in her reflections. She says, this was still the beginning of the semester and I was anxious for other class members to observe my untrained dance moves. I was quick to assume that having a background in classical or institutional dance training made you more qualified as a dancer. This goes back to the issue of socialization. For those first 20 minutes, I cautiously moved around. I wanted to make an escape and allow myself to fall freely into thought, but something was restraining me. Now thinking back on it, I know it is the rule of order, but back then I believed it to be the spectator's gaze. And I thought, this is a great thing. Like, I mean, she's 19. <laughs> uh, so you, you, have somebody, you know, you, you think in this situation, yeah, it's the others, you know, that's why you can't move. But actually to recognize that this is, and we worked on it, of course, as well, but that it's a rule of order, even the, this, this, the way she puts it, the rule of order. And that's a, there's, and I Googled that, that is not really a term. There's something that's called the special rule of order, and that's how parliaments are ordered, which is also interesting. <laughs> uh, but, the way that we are ordered as human beings, you know, this deep way of ordering. If you look at parliament, I mean, it takes, in average, and I don't know how it was today, I didn't see anything, uh, it takes about usually 20 to 25 minutes before anybody lifts their arm above their shoulders. <laughs> yeah, that's like, it doesn't make any sense, but it does that. Nobody lifts their arm up. It's a socially agreed, socially negotiated situation when it's okay, when it's non-threatening, and so on. And, and you have that rule of order, and, and that's what Badieu calls the state of the situation. Mm -hmm. He refers it much more to the state, you know, reproducing their politics. But I think it goes much, much deeper. It's everything. It's, it's not just evolutionary. It's, it's, it's the whole kind of a shebang of living and its history that, that is placed in us. Uh, and this rule of order is like, how do you deal with that rule of order? And how do you subvert it? So I think, you know, I would like to, to name that, that discussion about the rule of order. And thanks to Michelle for <laughs> coming up with that. Yeah, and I think we are almost at, at night time. So mm -hmm. this is fading out here. <coughs> Well, maybe then we have come a bit uh, to the end of the um, an evening and you're going to be around here and, you know, maybe yeah. you have additional questions. Um, I just want to point out one thing and I want you all to also keep it in mind, like the great American artist Man Ray was a landscape painter. He started out in Ridgewood, New Jersey, and I once went to an exhibition. I couldn't believe their most gorgeous paintings. But Man Ray at this time said, I can't represent contemporary world the invention of the cars, the airplane, the gramophone, uh, the movie scene and all that. I said, I, it's no longer possible to pretend I can just be a landscape painter. And he went, he you know, moved away, did solarization, did new work, all you know, all his abstract paintings. I think in a way, Michael's work, who you might not know ballet Frankfurt or Forsyth, they were a major force in the international ballet. They was the greatest, most innovative, forceful dance company you could see in Germany. And I saw them, it was, it was shocking what this guy did who came from this. So Michael worked with them. 
So what he does here is not that he says, oh, I'm somewhere in the downtown loft and we experiment some things and we'll do here or there. No, it is a conscious decision by a working artist, by a working choreographer to say, if I do choreography, if I do dance, if I engage in this kind of socially engaged art, I would call it, um, it's, a, it's a decision as an artist, as a way of thinking, and um, also as a comment, what we all have to do, what for him in his mind is the most significant, most important, most urgent way to engage. And I think it's a great, uh, a great undertaking and um, it will maybe take some time. You know, artists often anticipate a future, you know, um, as Roncier said, and uh, uh, because you're closer to that, probably we are not there yet, but I think it's, it's really a most fascinating and interesting uh, a way to think new about things, and so we would like to thank you for coming here, flying over, share it. Thanks for Corey to uh, thank you, Corey. put us out and put us in, and for you all to participate, and also stay till 9.30 uh, on a cold December day in New York. Uh, so um, thank you all for coming, and uh, what's your, maybe it's the last thing, what are your future projects? Are you working on something we should know? Uh, I'm working, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, uh, the, the, the two big projects that I was work was working on just collapsed over the summer, which I'm sorry. What were the projects? One was a, a big social choreographic project with American Ballet Theater, uh, and one was a big exhibition in, for three months at the National Museum in, in North Carolina. And both just didn't happen for different ways. Like, I actually walked away from, from ABT. Uh, but that's okay. You know, I feel like it's okay. Like, I, I, I have loads of challenges in terms of creating a new MFA program at Duke, uh, which is super interesting. And also, um, Developing like we're just launching for next next uh, in spring a working group around social choreography at Duke at the Humanities Lab as part of Michael Hart's Social Movement Lab, uh, which hopefully will grow into its own lab next next year. So there is some real and that's super exciting for me. Like I can do all these kind of technologies. We can just try them out, and I'm not so worried about museum representation at the moment. Like I feel like yeah, whatever will come. Well, great that you put Duke <laughs> on the map in the dance world. So congratulations again. Thank you all for coming.